All right, great, thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. So I'll be talking to you about the um, exciting topic of uh, great questions in online surveys um, and how we can think about making them uh, mobile friendly. So is that an impossible dream? All right, so grid questions, um, sometimes called a matrix question, is one of the most commonly used formats in online surveys. Um, they are used to measure multiple elements like brands or statements or behaviors. So if we have a series of items that we want our respondents to evaluate, um, they typically use the same graded response format. So most commonly the responses are presented in columns and then the elements um, that we want our respondents to evaluate are presented in rows. Um, and they, they tend to have kind of a controversial or perhaps a negative um, reputation. And that's because they um, are often associated with higher rates of suboptimal response. Um, and in the form of straight lining, there can be a lot of um, if respondents may pick the same response going down the grid. Um, or they're also associated with breakoff rates. Um, but they did evolve for a very specific reason. Um, and that is that they're more efficient uh, to complete what. Um, compared to putting each of the items on individual separate screens. And that's because manual responding is standardized, so it's very easy for the respondent to um, move up and down the columns of a grid. And then also response meanings are standardized. Um, so once the respondent learns the meaning of the scale at the top of the grid, they don't have to learn the scale again for each individual item as they would if it was presented on a separate screen. And so here's an example of what a grid question looks like. I'm sure we've all seen this before. In this case, we're using a five category important scale. And then here's what that same grid question looks like on my smartphone. So this is a screenshot from my smartphone. And what you can see is that here we're using a responsive template. So the, the software that we're using has detected the size of the screen the question text wraps appropriately, so there's no scrolling required to read the question. But the software wasn't able to shrink the grid down small enough in order to be, uh, make it fit the screen without scrolling required. If it had, the respondent probably wouldn't be able to read um, the items or the response options. And if for some reason they were able to read it, it would be very difficult for them to select the appropriate radio button because it would be so tiny. So there's a lot of scrolling required for the respondent um, to be able to complete this question. If they were to scroll right to pick a response over to the, the right side of the screen, you can see what happens. They lose sight of the item text. So then it's very difficult for them to remember the item, uh, the wording of the item, and then make sure they're properly aligning it with the, the row that they want to select the response for. And then of course the problem gets even worse if we scroll down and to the right. Here we're lost in a sea of radio buttons. So now we've lost sight of what these radio buttons really even mean. You can't see the items or the response options. So most of us when we're walking around in the world, we're interacting with our phones in portrait mode. Um, and this is true we found with surveys as well. Few people take the time to rotate the, their phone to a landscape mode if it will make their survey experience better. So we found at the beginning of our surveys that approximately 90% of our respondents are entering the survey in portrait mode. And then we've done a little bit of testing to kind of prompt respondents um, with grids to change to landscape orientation. And even with repeated prompts at every grid that they encounter, less than half of our respondents will take the time to rotate their screen. So that tells us that you know, it's, not, it's really not a good solution to try and expect respondents to engage with our surveys in the ways that we want them to. We need to come up with some solutions that will facilitate completion on the devices that they want and in the ways that they want. We can't expect them to change their behavior. By taking the survey for us, they're doing us a favor. So we need to make sure um, we're doing everything we can to help, help them complete our studies. Um, so as we saw in the example grid that I walked through in the beginning, even with five categories, it can be difficult to display on a smartphone. So we wanted to design a study where we could see if uh, we could shorten our response scales um, and what impact that would have on our survey estimates and validity um, in order to help facilitate completion on smartphones. So we set up some independent experiments um, and each of them we randomly assigned people to either three, four, or five response categories. And then we also tested both unipolar and bipolar scales. 
and I'll walk you through what those look like in a minute. All of the scales that we tested in this study were fully labeled um, because in some past work that we've done, we found that fully labeled scales tend to have higher validity than when we have an N labeled scale. So in this study, each of the points, the scale points that respondents saw had a, a label associated with them. So for this study, we used uh, GFK's knowledge panel, which is the largest online probability based panel here in the US. Um, we had just over 3,200 panelists complete the study. It was a short uh, online eight-minute study. So this is the, the question that I'll be showing you the results for. We asked them about some political issues, um, and the, the items that we asked about were are fairly divisive uh, here in the U.S. They tend to kind of align along parties, different the different parties. And these are the response categories that our respondents were randomly assigned to. So you can see the top three are our unipolar scales. With the unipolar scale, it ranges from uh, the absence of a concept to the presence of a concept. So in this case, we're looking at agreement. So you can see that they all range from do not agree to very strongly agree. And then we have kind of different gradations of agreement um, depending on the length of the scale. A bipolar scale, on the other hand, ranges from the absence of a concept to the presence, or sorry, the polar opposites. So in this case, it's disagreement uh, to agreement. Um, and then with the bipolar scale, because we have those polar opposites, um, we can have a neutral category when we have an odd number of scale points. So both the three and the five category here has that neutral with the four category, we don't have that. We have the two disagree and the, the two agree. So first, looking at the, the means or the results um, that we got, uh, we're looking here at a range adjusted scale. So whether they saw the three, four or five category, we've um, transformed them to be range from zero to one in order to allow us to compare the results. And what we see at first is that what we've found with other studies is replicated here, that with a bipolar scale, we tend to get higher means than we do with a unipolar scale. Um, and then what we see here was what was of interest in this study is that we don't really see much difference um, in when we're comparing the three, four, or five category scales. The means are pretty much the same and the relative ordering of the items, kind of the story that we would tell when we're looking at the results stays the same. Uh, regardless of the number of scale points that we're using. We also looked at the um, standard deviations. Um, there's kind of a perception out there that with a longer scale, you'll get increased variance, um, and we find that not to be true. So here again, looking at that range adjusted zero to one um, scale categories. Uh, and here we don't see that there's any increase in variance with the increase in scale points. And then finally, looking at validity. So we use those individual political items to predict overall party ID. And here we're not really seeing any difference. It doesn't seem like either unipolar or bipolar comes out as being of, of much greater validity. And that's also not true with longer scales. They're, they're pretty well even in terms of the um, ability to predict party identification. So the results from the other two experiments that we set up were pretty similar. I'm not gonna walk you through them, but overall it tells pretty much the same story. Uh, fewer response categories show similar means and variance as the longer scales. Uh, validity was not significantly improved when we use more scale points. So that tells us that we can think about dropping down to three or four responses. Um, the unipolar format may yield optimum levels of validity. And it works well with the, the thumbs environment and the screen, screen constraints of the smartphone. Um, but here's another screenshot of, of a grid from my smartphone. And here you can see we are using a three category scale. Um, and it's still kind of unwieldy to, to complete on my phone. And that's because the item lengths themselves are pretty long. So there's a lot of wrapping, which makes it difficult to read. So even when we go up, uh, ahead and shorten our scales, we should think about some alternative designs to this traditional grid, just because that grid is so difficult to fit uh, on a smartphone screen in the portrait mode. So here's again an example of what a traditional grid looks like. 
And then here's uh, an alternative format that we've been uh, testing called the accordion grid or accordion format. So here in the accordion format, you can see that the respondent has answered the first four items just like in the traditional grid. Um, for Facebook, they selected do not like. Uh, right now they're working on answering Google. So you can see the Google um, box is extended. The response options are visible. The respondent would go ahead and select a response for Google. Once they do that, it will collapse and then Pizza Hut will open up and the, the response options for Pizza Hut will be visible. So what we've done here is kind of transposed um, the response layout from a horizontal presentation to a vertical presentation in order to kind of minimize or get rid of the extent, the uh, horizontal scrolling that is needed with the, the traditional grid on the smartphone. And if a respondent didn't want to select an answer for Google, they can just go ahead and then click on Pizza Hut or Kellogg's or whichever other one they want to answer. Um, and that, that will, Google would collapse and then Kellogg's would open up. So we wanted to conduct a study to see what effect um, the accordion grid, switching to accordion grid would have on our results. Again, we used uh, the knowledge panel to conduct that study. This was just a five minute study um, we had over 2,000 panelists complete it, and respondents were randomly assigned to one of the two response formats. So they either saw the traditional grid or they saw the accordion grid. Um, first, looking at the means here, we see we had a question about how you would rate each of the following in your local community. So there are a number of different characteristics of a community. Um, and we see that there are a few significant differences, uh, but overall they tend to be pretty small and not in a systematic direction. Um, and again, the relative order of the items was pretty close. So for the most part, the story that we would tell about what aspects of the community are important to people or, or that they're satisfied with would be the same whether we were using the traditional grid or the accordion grid. We also had respondents um, rate their, their self-accuracy and the vis visibility of responses. So after we showed them the grid question, we asked them how accurate they felt they were in responding. And here we see uh, no difference in comparing the traditional to the accordion. And that's true when we're looking at all respondents as well as just focusing in on the respondents who completed the study on a smartphone. And then the same thing for ease of seeing responses. We don't see a, a difference between traditional and accordion either overall or just among our smartphone respondents. We also looked at validity. So here we use those individual items of community satisfaction to predict overall community satisfaction. And here the accordion grid came out a little bit higher validity um, compared to the traditional grid. And some of the other experiments that we've done, they've been a little bit closer or the uh, traditional grid has come out slightly on top. So basically we've concluded that pretty much the validity overall is comparable between the two formats. So results from the other experiments, again, were pretty similar, so I'm not going to walk through all of them, but the conclusions that we, we've drawn is that the accordion format appears to be a viable alternative. Um, it's a more smartphone friendly, it minimizes the amount of scrolling uh, required, which makes um, reduces the burden on our respondents and will make our survey shorter for them to complete. Um, our results were similar in means and relative order, um, and the, the validity as well was pretty comparable. So we feel like the accordion grid is a viable alternative. So overall, um, to facilitate survey um, completion on smartphones, we need to, to get creative and, and not expect our respondents to come to us. We need to go to them. We need to um, come up with some creative solutions, and that includes shortening scales, uh, which we can, we can do without sacrificing precision and validity. Uh, and then we need to think about some alternative designs that will work better for the smartphone touchscreen, small screen world. Um, the accordion format is one that we like um, and that seems to work pretty well. And that's it for today. Thank you all very much.